All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Caitlin Fielding and I have our other clinician, Luann Bertel with us. Um, we are going to be talking about supporting females with autism in the school setting. So just as a quick reminder, um, if you have not already, we have a previous webinar that was recorded by uh, Dr. Noel and um, Dr. Aaron Lazat, and they have it um, that was live in October. The uh, premise of that webinar was rethinking the ratios and improving recognition of females with autism spectrum disorder. So if you've not already viewed that, um, this is the second part to that series. So there could be bits of information that you have not, um, may not be getting. Um, so if I, I would recommend you going back and trying to take a look at that webinar if you have not already. Yeah, it's a wonderful training. All right. So before we get started, we're just going to talk a little bit about ourselves and just let you know who we are, what we do, and why we're here. Um, so my name is Caitlin Fielding. Like I said, I am a clinical support specialist with FAU CARD. Um, my background is in special education, and I have a master's degree in educational leadership. Most of my background comes from working with children of all age ranges, um, even adults. I particularly um, work with individuals <clears throat> that are in transition, whether that be middle school to high school or high school to adulthood. Um, so I work with here at FAU CARD, I work with our transition age uh, students. So those are um, students that are anywhere between the ages of 11 all the way through adults. And I work with our Northern community. So I work out of our Jupiter campus and I work from Lake Worth all the way up to Jupiter. And then I also serve our Western communities. So that's Wellington, um, out in Royal Palm, Royal Palm. And then I also work with uh, the Glades in that area as well. Luann. I'm Luann Verteau. I'm the clinical support specialist uh, specifically for Indian River County. I also co-teach our Building Better Behaviors course for parents. I'm a board certified behavior analyst and I have a master's degree in education from Ohio State University. I started my career way back when as an EST, ESE teacher in Columbus at a specialized school. Uh, back then autism was not particularly widely diagnosed, but most of the children that I had in my second grade class there uh, were children that would now be identified on the spectrum. I've worked as a behavior analyst in schools across the Treasure Coast, and I also have an adult sister with autism, so the subject of girls with autism is near and dear to my heart. Thank you. And I also um, work with our law enforcement initiative and I work in our autism friendly business initiative as well. So I'm just going to do a quick brief overview of FAU card for those of you who might not know. Um, we are grant funded through the Florida Department of Education um, and we provide free consultation support and training to individuals with autism, their family, friends and professionals and community members who support them as well. Um, so again, we do quite a bit of training uh, with teachers, we work with our law enforcement, and we um, try to collaborate with our community members as well, again, through the Autism Friendly Business Program, making sure our community is um, well-versed in autism and understanding it and um, making it as autism friendly as possible. The areas that we serve are the five county regions. So this includes Indian River County, St. Lucie County, Martin, Okeechobee, and Palm Beach counties. Um, we do have three office locations. There's one on the FAU Boca campus, one on FAU Jupiter campus, and one um, and on the Indian River uh, State campus as well in Port St. Lucie. Um, although we have all different areas that we serve, we all collaborate together and we have one dynamic service that we help um, support everybody in our community with. The best, best way to put an uh, individual or their family member in contact with us is by one of these. Um, these contact numbers or this contact email. Um, this allows uh, them to fill out their information and put the child's name, where they're located. Um, and then we have it, somebody who frequently checks our emails and our voicemail box and they um, help us, they help kind of disseminate the information onto which clinician would best be supporting your child or your family member. So let's talk a little bit about the manifestation of uh, autism spectrum disorder in females. With students with co uh, significant cognitive impairments, there are fewer differences between boys and girls. However, with children with higher cognitive abilities, the differences are far more observable. 
girls tend to be identified later than boys. And there are many theories and, and studies about why that is. About, because autism is frequently considered a male um, disorder, uh, something we associate with boys, evaluators may be less likely to think of autism when it comes to girls that they might be looking at. Uh, also, a lot of the evaluation tools were developed uh, with boys with autism, so they may not very well catch the slight differences in girls, just like we know that with many different kinds of medical tests that were developed with men don't always catch all of the symptoms with women, uh, autism evalu evaluations may be somewhat similar in that regard. Also, girls develop many or demonstrate many characters of autism differently than boys. They might be less likely to engage in repetitive behaviors than boys, or they may be more subtle than what you might see with boys. And also their restrictive interests might be less obvious. So you may see uh, you know, an eight-year-old girl who's very obsessed with uh, My Little Ponies, and that's not an unusual thing. Lots of girls at that age might have that very specific interest. The difference might come in how they interact with those with those toys or those items or that subject that they're uh, that they're obsessed with, do they do they share? Do they um, talk about it exclusively? Do they let other people you know participate in that? Uh, there's where we would see some of the differences come in. And I think also kind of just piggybacking off of that with males, we tend to think of like those restrictive repetitive behaviors, those stereotypical per se, repetitive behaviors in, a, in an individual with autism, like the hand flapping or the rocking um, or things like that, that we might see more in males than we would in females. Right. Mm -hmm. So some other things that we'll see with females that may be a little bit different. Girls with autism are generally more interested in making friends and interacting with others than boys on the spectrum, just as in you know, neurotypical females may be a little more skewed towards socialization uh, than males are. So while they show more interest, they still have the challenges that interfere with successful socialization for, for um, with autism. Uh, another difference is, that is from boys is the girls are much better at masking, sometimes called camouflaging um, their autistic traits. They're often aware of being different and try really hard to imitate uh, the kind of interactions they see with their neurotypical peers, siblings, or even adults. However, this is a coping skill and it doesn't necessarily uh, work uh, you know, over the course of time. An example I had when I was back in the day when I was working, uh, went for a first appointment with a female client, I went to the home and the mother said, uh, you know, so-and-so would really like to go down to the mini mart and uh, get a fountain drink. Would you take her? Sure, it was a great opportunity to do some socializing and to get to know her a little better. So we hopped in the car, we drove to the store and she asked me about, you know, my family. She asked me what movies I liked, all those kind of things. Uh, we went in and got a drink and on the way back, she told me about you know, some of the things that she was interested in. She loved horses, she loved, um, a certain TV show. And we got back to the house and I said to mom, oh, she has really good social skills. I'm so impressed. And mom just smiled. So the next time I come to the house, um, mom says, well, she had a wonderful time with you. And uh, uh, what, would you like to take her again? I said, oh yeah, it was wonderful. Let's go do it. So we head in the car, jump in the car to head the mini mart. And guess what? She asked me the exact same questions. She told me the exact same things about herself. It was almost a, a, a videotape of the, of the interaction we had had the previous, previous time. She was an expert at camouflaging or masking, but she only had one routine or repertoire to work with. This is one of the reasons we don't always catch uh, the autistic characteristics in girls on the spectrum. Girls are often less likely to demonstrate what we think of as acting out behaviors, such as physical aggression toward persons or property. If they do have overt behavioral issues, they tend to be more in the form of uh, verbal disruption or aggression. However, girls on the spectrum um, are often have a lot of coexisting disorders with their autism, like anxiety, OCD, later in life eating disorders. Uh, just like neurotypical females, girls on the spectrum have a greater tendency to internalize rather than externalize their uh, emotional upheaval. And just to um, add something 
typically we, when, you know, females are diagnosed and how they are later diagnosed in life, um, they end up what they like to call alphabet soup. So they end up with all of these these disorders or these things at the end, my child has OCD, ADD, ADHD, they have anxiety, depression. So they end up with all of these diagnoses. And when it really comes down to it and they find a professional that can, can evaluate and do the evaluations appropriately, um, which typically, again, doesn't come till later down the line, we tend to see it more of those prepubescent ages, those 10, 11, 12s, when they're heading into their teens, where they're being diagnosed and they're all falling under this umbrella of autism spectrum disorder. So again, yeah, they it comes along with the camouflaging and the masking and, and how well our uh, females are able to do that. And that, yes, they'll often get all those other diagnoses before someone finally realizes that autism may be at the core of that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the behavioral concerns. Um, females with autism may be able to maintain appropriate behavior through all or part of the school day, um, but they'll often experience something that we call the four o'clock meltdown. So at the end of the day, or at the end of the activity, when the demands lessen, uh, then they may decompensate. Parents may report behaviors to teachers or to neighbors that, that, that others simply can't believe that they've never seen from this child. Um, and you may notice situations at school with girls with autism where they will have difficulty following the situations where kids with autism uh, typically struggle. They may get through them, but then afterwards, they will have some difficulties. So those kind of things like transitions after coming back from the lunchroom, um, after unstructured activities or situations like uh, recess or, or coming in after they get off the bus, in group situations or any situation that has with ongoing social interactions, uh, girls may have difficulty that even if they maintain during them, they may have some difficulty following them because they need to regroup. Yeah, and I, the social communication piece is so big, especially for our females um, uh, with autism, they tend to kind of lack that filter um, that, that most would have. And that's where we, we would tend to see it, where it would interfere with some of their social interactions and making friends and being involved in group activities and kind of like the way we see neurotypical females interact in those group settings where they have their little girl clicks. Um, it's difficult for our females with autism to kind of relate to that because again, like previously said, um, they like to focus on their one and only. And if they're not being related to in those situations, it's difficult for them to have those social emotional connections or those friendships and those back and forth conversations that we see. And it's typically um, difficult when we think about conversations and social skills, again, during those lunchtime routines where it's unstructured, during recess where it's unstructured. So those group situ situations and those, those interactions can tend to cause um, a bit of anxiety. And that's where we can see those um, behaviors come out or those anxiety behaviors start to um, manifest. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it's like they'll get part of the picture, but not quite all of it. Mm -hmm. So they'll have some of the skills, but not all of them. And when something goes wrong, they get can get very stressed and very upset about that. Yeah. And that's where we see that, again, where those challenging behaviors would, would start to come out. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to uh, touch a little bit about teaching strategies in the classroom and how you can kind of help support your uh, females within the classroom um, with some of these, these ways that would uh, just make it a little bit easier for not only the females that are in the classroom with autism, but your whole your classroom as a whole and making it run a little bit smoother. So we're gonna look at classroom setup and how uh, setting up your classroom in, in a particular manner um, will help as far as uh, those lessening some of those anxieties, making sure we're supporting our individuals that um, might have some of those sensory overloads, some of those hyper or hypo sensitivities um, to things around them, sounds, smells, um, noises. Um, we're gonna talk about putting in a quiet space um, where that can fit in in your classroom and what it can look like um, and how it can best support those females um, that might need that extra you know, downtime to recoup, coop, to decompress, especially after, again, those unstructured activities coming in. It might take them a minute to transition um, out of those and then coming in back into work uh, might be a bit difficult for them. So having a quiet space, 
um, is definitely a good uh, part to part to have of your classroom to make sure that there is an area that they can kind of go to. Visual schedules, these are huge. Um, they're very, very uh, underutilized, I would say, um, in far, as far as classrooms go, but they're particularly good as far as uh, helping our females on the spectrum and any, in the, any, per, any individual on the spectrum in particular, help yeah. understand what's coming next, um, you know, it's difficult when there's unpredictability in a schedule. So when they can see it and they can visually see it, it helps them prepare for what's coming next. And it kind of, it can help eliminate some of those anxieties, some social stressors. Um, it can help eliminate some of those challenging behaviors that you might see, those meltdowns. Timers, again, just like a visual, visual schedule, it gives them a heads up. They're able to see it. Um, we're going to talk about utilizing those within the classroom as well. Whole group directive. So addressing a whole group and not singling out one individual student. So even if the directive is just for one student out of 20 students, singling them out or making them feel awkward or, or odd um, will create anxiety, it will create challenging behaviors, it will make them feel uncomfortable. So even just giving a whole group directive or utilizing a whole group timer within your classroom will help eliminate some of those anxieties but it is helping support maybe one or two individuals in that classroom, but we're still addressing the entire group. So we're eliminating that, that singling out that they might feel. And then we're gonna talk about social stories and power cards and how those, those uh, two social narratives in particular can be very beneficial, especially for our females on the spectrum. I think when we talk about these kind of things, Caitlin, it, it's one of those things where it's like, well, you know, it, it takes time, upfront work to put a lot of these things in effect. But the amazing thing is when you do these things, what it relieves, the time it relieves you of afterwards, um, things that you don't have to deal with later because you've, you've, you've set all these things up to help, help deal with particular kinds of issues, uh, it makes a teacher's life much easier in the long run. Yeah, so definitely when, especially starting like a new school year or even coming back from Christmas break, if you've noticed that um, maybe some things were in the classroom that maybe weren't working for you in the beginning of the classroom, or maybe you had new students added, maybe you had a child, a uh, female on the, on the autism spectrum that was added and you need to now kind of revamp your classroom or look at how you're running things. Um, these are all things that like Luann just said, they will help in the long run. So making sure that you have these things in place, um, although time consuming um, at, some, at some point, um, you will definitely benefit from having them in your classroom and helping as far as helping the entire classroom run smoother and easier and making your life a little bit easier down the line. So here's a, a view of a classroom setup, and we're going to show a video clip after this. And I, I'd like to say this is kind of more of like a middle school, high school setup as far as how um, they have things kind of dispersed in the classroom here. Again, you see your quiet areas in the corner. Um, they have something stating that there's a curtain, so you're able to close it off. Um, there's teacher work areas, small desk stations. Um, there's student areas as far as near the teacher teacher's desks where, where you can place your uh, group work um, and then making sure your materials and things like that are set up and ready to go accessible, making sure that again unstructured time can be somewhat structured so. Maybe you have a group of students that work more slowly than others is there, do you have things set up in your classroom for independent work. Is there mastered activities that those children who are already completed, can they work on task bins? Can they um, do complete independent work uh, folders by themselves to you know, alleviate some of those challenging behaviors, alleviate some of those stressors in the classroom and help as far as um, you being able to, as a teacher, put your efforts into helping support those children that might need a little more help. Yeah, I think you make a good point, Caitlin, when you talk about some of those mastered tasks and things around, because if if, a, if a, a girl's feeling overwhelmed or feeling uh, stressed out or just struggling in a particular situation, having something that they can do and do well and being able to go back to that is a great way to help them refocus and get back on track. Yeah, and even some of those, those calming techniques, and we're gonna touch a little bit more on that, um, that can be, you can incorporate maybe some mastered math skills in with some coloring. So maybe it's a, 
do the math problems that are already mastered. They're super easy for them. And then they can go back in and they can pick the colors and they can color them in that way. It's more of a calming strategy. It's mastered. They're feeling good about themselves because they can fly through this thing. They're, they can do it independently all by themselves. And then they have some time. They can have a little bit of fun and they can color and they can do what they want with the, with the, um, with the activity. And a lot of our girls really do struggle with the issue of, um, you know, the, the, they are more conscious of, of what they feel are their limitations or when they're not being successful. So being able to, um, you know, build self-esteem with something they've already mastered or that they're good at is a great strategy to have something to have in place. Great. So here's the video clip. And um, this is more of um, like an elementary, I believe it's a grade two through four or two through six. Um, this and is a resource room. But, yeah, yeah. And so this is a resource room and this is a great video clip to show how she sets up her classroom and the ways that she utilizes the supports in her classroom, even though maybe some of her students have already mastered some of those things. Um, and she does state something in, that, in the very beginning of the video about how they've, they've mastered this, but it's something that helps keep them on track and it helps keep them going through their day. Hi everyone, this is Gina from theautismhelper.com and this is a tour of my classroom. Um, right now I'm servicing kids from first grade to third grade and they come in and out of the classroom. So come on in. First, I have my picture schedules that all of my kiddos use. They're a little bit beyond it, but it just helps with organization. So they know to take their tags and they match them with the bigger pictures around the room. Um, over here is my cozy corner where kids can come if they need to calm down or take a time out and just kind of breathe and they can use the cushions and our Tucker the Turtle story. And then over here is my main work with teacher area. I have two. This is where I like to work with um, kiddos in the afternoon for reading. I have a basket where they match their tag. And then all my supplies are right behind me, right where I can grab them. I have matching folders. I have my materials for my reading lessons up here and math upcoming lessons. It's a little messy right now because we're closing up for the end of the school year. Um, more supplies because we know if we've got enough things for kiddos to do, we have less behavior problems. Calendar, core board that's removable, and again, extra materials like adaptive books for early finishers. And then over here is another section for work with teacher. And here is where another assistant can work. And while I work with a few students here, um, we have another couple of students going to independent areas. So they've got fine motor boxes, language arts, and math. And then we have some file folders over here that match. And they simply just get their boards, put them up on the wall, and then they take the number and they come over and they match it to, it might be a box, which they would take to their desk, or it could be a file folder they'll go over and complete that at their desk. And they know that when they're all finished, they put their purple board back up and then they go check their schedule. Um, over here at this work with teachers table, I have tons of materials that it, the kids could use. I have extra matching activities for early finishers again. Um, I put in all my work and my anchor charts for the day, just in here so we can easily pull them out so the kiddos can work on them. I have some data sheets right here with all my kids' goals, level curriculum, extra anchor charts, all ready to go. And just pull them out as we need them. And marker boards. And lots of extra material to work on. Whenever our kiddos are done all of their work with teacher and independent work, then they come back over here and they can get their goose tag over here and this is our play area they put their tag in a basket and then they can play with whatever they like to play my only rule is that they clean up first before they go to a different activity so they can play with any of this stuff or we have a nice little play-doh area over here and some sensory boxes so that's the quick tour of my classroom if you have any questions just leave them in the comments below thanks for visiting I think she makes such a, such a good point where where we talked about earlier 
she has lots of materials for if they finish early and mastered tasks and things like that. So like she said, they're, when they're done with their work, they have somewhere to go. They have something to do. It's readily available. They're not wandering around the classroom. They're not raising their hand. They're not just hanging out, sitting in their desks and waiting. Um, they always have something ready to go and ready to do. And that will, again, prevent those challenging behaviors and pre prevent um, you from having to kind of redirect constantly in your classroom and, and try to find something for them to do. I think it's real important too that that, that distinction between group areas and individual areas because um, kids with autism, girls on the spectrum are going to need those times to, to isolate a little bit, to do something independently so they can regroup again for when there are, when there are, are group or, or larger tasks and being able to break the day down between going back and forth between those is a great way to be able to set things up. Yeah, and again, just creating those different spaces in that one room, just with dividers, with different areas. You can utilize furniture. Um, I know I used to have, in, when I was teaching in my classroom, we had a rolling filing cabinet that we used to kind of use as dividers and put things in between. Um, maybe computer desks with dividers on them. Those can make, create own little cubby spaces for independent work areas. Um, just you can get creative and it doesn't, again, have to be necessarily specific to like, I need to create this boundary, um, but you can utilize your furniture in your classroom and creating those, those safe spaces and those areas to work. And your traffic flow as well, yes. Exactly. So like um, we just saw in the video, she has had a, a nice quiet area there. So some of the ways to create a, a quiet area within your classroom, you wanna make sure that there's some visual calming strategies and not just visual calming strategies, but calming strategies that have been taught. So a lot of times um, I'll see, I, well, I sent them to their room or I sent them over there and I told them to calm down. Well, that not, do they even know how to calm down? Is there, is there a visual on the wall that we can point to to kind of walk them through this? Um, we know in the beginning of the year, kids start coming straight out of, of uh, summer and they probably were very unstructured. So even if they say, oh, I had them in my class last year and I know how to do it and they know how to do it. Think about if they're coming even out of a weekend, if they're unstructured coming into the classroom, is there ways that we can walk through this? Is there is that area being utilized often by an individual, a female on the spectrum? Can we walk through these strategies that are readily available to us and say, okay, so we're in the calming area. What are the steps that we need to take to calm down? Mm -hmm. So just making sure that they know that when they're in that quiet area, that there are calming strategies available, make sure that they know how to utilize those calming strategies as well. And I think sensory items also. Luann, do you want to add to the calming strategies? No, I was just going to say that whatever you have in the quiet area should be something a child can do independently and is an actual quiet activity. It's a place for a child to be alone and to bring themselves back down to be able to, to function. You don't want your most reinforcing items necessarily in there because it's not necessarily considered a break, but it is a place for a kid to regroup and to, to, to get ready to come back and join you know, the larger class or the activity underway. Yeah, and some of those sensory items you can put in there. Um, I have a, a photo up here that um, you can do fidgets, you can do a fidget spinner, headphones, those noise canceling headphones are great if you wanna have um, noise canceling headphones, even if there's uh, headphones with quiet music, calm music, calming, calming sounds. Um, squeeze balls are great, those stress balls. Um, anything that will take their anxiety down. Um, if there's a sensory chairs, I know I used to have a sensory chair that was like a, kind of like a spring. So they would sit in it and they could bounce on it and it kind of just alleviates some of the pressure and it's, it's calming, it's kind of squeezes. Um, and again, like writing and drawing materials are great, especially our girls on the, on the spectrum. They love to write and draw. They like to do things that are independent and calming. Um, I tend to see girls that would love to um, do those uh, really intricate coloring pictures, like those adult coloring books that were very intricate and small and it, it took, took their anxiety down. And then books and magazines, those teen people magazines were great. Um, I saw a lot of my, my females that I would teach on the spectrum, they loved like One Direction or Shawn Mendes or any of those teen pop singers. Um, so those magazines were great um, to kind of allow them to decompress, have uh, some calming, some chill time, some calming strategies, and then they would be ready to come back into um, the classroom or come back to do their work. 
-hmm. Absolutely. Visual so, schedules, go ahead. I'll talk about those for a minute. So go visual ahead. schedules is one of those things that they don't necessarily have to be pictorial because a lot of times we'll say, okay, our kids don't need visual schedules, they can read. Um, they should fit the reading and developmental level of who of the, of the of the child you're using them for. But whether they're text or pictures, they should be uncluttered and easy for your student to follow. Uh, and a visual schedule doesn't necessarily have to be for the whole day. It can be for a part of the day or even for a particular activity that um, that one of your students finds challenging. Um, you also have to be, for a visual schedule to be effective, the child has to interact with it regularly. And this takes, because I'll hear teachers say, it's like, well, you know, they don't use it, they don't even look at the schedule. We have to teach the children to interact with the schedule. They should either be removing, checking off, um, you know, Xing out each activity as they go along. And that's gonna make them more independent in following the routine or the activity. It's also going to help them um, feel a sense of control or mastery over their, over their day and over what's happening. And that really goes a long way toward reducing anxiety for, for some of our girls that may be quite anxious because then they know what's coming next. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, if there are special activities or there are different things going on that you're somehow uh, indicating that on the schedule. And in a best case scenario is after kids have gotten good at schedules, they're actually part of building their schedule uh, with the teacher, which also gives them a sense of mastery. And then the other great thing about these is you have to do less prompting because uh, girls learn how to do them on their own. And that's what we want them to be able to do in the long run is be more independent. Independence uh, and mastery makes us feel good about ourselves. And these are strategies that will help girls do that. Yeah, and again, like it even it goes along with um, if they're utilizing it in the classroom and they're they're able to see um, their day being checked off or they're coming to the end of their day. Um, it makes those transitions even going home where that could cause some anxiety where they're they're seeing um, their day kind of dwindle down or they're checking things off. Um, they know that. Um, that they're going to head home and it would it will lessen the anxiety of that particular transition as well because you know coming into school leaving school those are bigger transitions than math to science or mm -hmm. math to reading um so it'll lessen the anxiety and and uh, again like luann said you can tailor them to a particular student there's um one on here that would particularly uh, uh pertain to a, a female that might need to do something during her day those particular things like we have listed here a daily schedule that might be for an entire class but then there's one here on the left that we can look at that that can be incorporated into their daily schedule so maybe they have to use the restroom two times a day and they they need to um, do something in the restroom twice a day this is where we can incorporate it into that schedule and they can have a sense of mastery and again it's not being prompted you're not having to ask you're not have to check um, you're not having to go in and make sure things are being done. Um, and it creates a sense of independence and it's, and it makes them feel good. Yeah, these are great for grooming activities for, you know, any of those kind of things that, that a girl is going to need to do, but she may not necessarily want attention called to herself when she needs to do them. The schedules will help with that. And I know I used to utilize that, especially for grooming or hygiene goals and on IEPs, um, where if I had a female that needed a hygiene goal um, in particular, I would create a box. I could put it in the away um, and it was discreet and it was part of her daily schedule. Maybe it's not a picture of it on there. Maybe it's a number and they're taking the number over to the box and they're grabbing the hygiene box and they're going to the bathroom. Um, I would create hygiene boxes with deodorant and uh, uh, toothpaste and mouthwash and sanitary items and anything, face wipes, anything that you might need, um, especially as a female, even coming out of lunch. If you, what if you came out of PE and it's, and it's sweaty and it's hot out? We live in Florida here, so it's very hot out. Deodorant was a must. So um, even like I said earlier, 
not even just singling out one individual, maybe it's an entire class thing where they all have their own hygiene kits and they all have their hygiene boxes and they're going to the restroom and they're taking turns. And this is a great activity. And I used to use this um, coming out of PE in particular or coming off the playground in particular where they came in and they were stinky and sweaty and hot. And it's, it's a good way to transition back into getting, um, getting back into work also, because it allows them to go to the restroom. They can take their time, wash up, clean themselves off. And then it gives them time, some downtime for that everyone to kind of transition back into the classroom, calm down, have a little bit of chill time, and then hop back into the next activity. And so for with our timers, timers are a great strategy because they will help girls start to self-monitor better. Um, if you have students, and I've had lots of them who don't like the sound of a be beeping or ringing timer, then you've got visual timers, you have the sand timers, or you can even mute a computerized timer uh, to do. I, there's a, the stopwatch that uh, that we have on there. Uh, that is one of my favorite ones too, Caitlin, for uh, using for classroom activities. Um, one thing I always really liked about timers uh, in the classroom is that they help reduce argumentative behavior and disruption because you're not telling someone that time is up or they need to stop or whatever. The timer is doing that. So that takes a lot of the the conflict or the argument out of activities when it's not the adult who's who's giving that direction. Yeah, and then I think just utilizing whole group timers is great, even just transitioning again around the classroom. You have it on the board, it's everybody's thing, they're transitioning, but maybe as far as something on a, like an individual schedule or an individual um, time of day, there's a certain independent timer that might go off or might be in a desk or on the side or um, maybe it's just a time card that um, they have sitting there that is used to as a reminder for them to go do something on their own or independently utilize the bathroom, whatever it may be. Those are great for two for kids that are transitioning to to other subjects. Maybe they're going to a different class for a certain period or they're, they, they're going to speech or OT or something like that. Timers can be a great way of uh, uh, helping work with those with the schedule. So strategies for the classroom. Um, again, we kind of touched a little bit more on this already, um, but we wanna make sure that, especially when we talk about our uh, ASD population, our females with, with autism, um, that when we're giving verbal directions that they're brief and concise. When we tend to give directions um, as teachers as neurotypicals around in the community, we tend to say, oh, go do this, 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 and this, and not even think that maybe I haven't even processed number one before you're already telling me number four. So when you're giving verbal directions in particular, you want to make sure that there's, you're checking for understanding, that they're understanding that you've, already, you've said, okay, come sit down, and they're actually heading towards you before we're actually giving the next direction, and that we're um, making sure that it's a concise direction. Um, individuals on the spectrum tend to take things out of context that comes with autism spectrum disorder. It is a social communication disorder. So if you say, come grab a chair and sit next to me, they might literally grab a chair and then come walk it over to you where there's might be a chair right next to you waiting saying, but you're telling them just come sit here in this chair. So you want to be concise. You want to be brief. You want to make sure that they're understanding what you're saying before you're moving on to directions two through four, make sure what they're understanding number one, before we move on. I think a lot of our girls on this spectrum too, is they can talk a blue streak, uh, yeah. but just because they're very, very verbal does not mean that they're processing verbal information coming in in quite the same way. So yeah, keeping it brief, keeping it simple. And the more distractions there are, which of course there are tons of distractions in a classroom, the harder it is to process that information. So uh, a brief and clear is definitely the way to go. And common non-judgmental tone of voice, that's a big one, um, especially for our girls. We all know that females tend to be a little more sensitive. Um, they tend to kind of internalize and get a little bit more upset if you say things, maybe your tone of voice is off, um, maybe you're directly speaking to them and they get embarrassed about it. Um, so again, like those whole group 
instructions. Maybe you're just implying to that one in particular student. Um, but making sure it's calm, it's non-judgmental. We want, don't want to make anybody feel bad, um, even if we're trying to be brief and concise with our direction. But we want to make sure that it's non-judgmental and we, that they're that they're not taking it and internalizing it and and thinking that they're being singled out in particular for something that's going on inside the classroom. Um, supporting verbal directions with uh, picture and te uh, textual cues. This is uh, goes along, I, I think, along with our visual schedules. You want to make sure that whatever schedules or directions are given um, that they are to the age appropriateness, to the leveling of the student that you are teaching. Um, if there needs to be picture or, or textual cues, so be it. I think, again, we go back to autism being a social communication disorder. We know that 93% of our communication is through nonverbal body language. So a lot of times our individuals on the spectrum don't pick up on nonverbal body language. So if they're hearing verbal direction, that's only 7%. So they're hearing the words, but they're not picking up on certain cues. So we want to make sure that they there's pictures to go along with it. That maybe there's certain um, certain directions that are given in in different ways, um, the way that we say things. Um, so if it's not being understood, maybe the first time, we want to make sure that we can we change the way that we say something, or we change the way that it's uh, administered or given to uh, the the student or the group as a whole. You know, there's there's the old saying that um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results. Mm -hmm. There is a tendency when we give directions, if a, if a child doesn't follow the direction, just to keep saying it over. So by changing it up and using some other kind of cue, whether it's a gesture, whether it's a picture, whether it's something in writing, can get you a very different result. Um, one of my one of my favorite um, favorite things that happened with a, with a, uh, it was actually a high school girl I was working with with autism. Um, it was a transition time from, from um, to, time to go to lunch and everybody was up and moving around the class and getting ready and lining up. And it was a pretty, you know, a, I wouldn't call it chaotic, but it was, it was a somewhat, you know, very active environment. And she had been asked to go wash her hands. The teacher had said, go wash your hands. And she was sort of wandering the classroom and just totally, in fact, what she was doing, she started to repeat what the teacher was saying rather than doing it. And so what we finally did was it just took a post-it note and wrote on the piece of paper, wash your hands and handed that to her. She looked right at it, said, go wash your hands and walked in the restroom and washed her hands. So just adding that piece of text kind of got through the other noise and things that were going around, uh, going along that, that 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 were not that the words were not reaching her at that time. Yeah, and a lot yeah. of times, what um, what works well, especially um, keeping sticky notes all around your room or <laughs> whiteboards. I used to have whiteboards hung all around my room with those uh, markers that you can velcro right on it, so that again, if it's verbally, they're not getting it. Um, then writing it, if they can read, write it down, wash your hands or make a list, one, two, three, wash your hands, get your lunchbox line up. And so that takes out the, again, the constant verbal reminder, what are you supposed to be doing? Where are you supposed to be going? And again, it's, that's, it's not teaching them anything. And as a teacher and an educator, it's just driving you a bit crazy because you're constantly having to remind the same student when you have to worry about X other number of students in the room um, where to go, what to do, how to do it. So again, the delivery, if it's not working the first time, what can we do to change it and how can we deliver it differently in order for our, our students or our females on the spectrum to understand this? Um, and then it, uh, the special interest areas, um, incorporating those of special interest. Um, again, I brought up from the quiet area, having those people magazines with those, uh, those teen pop stars in there. If there's certain times of day that maybe might be more difficult for our females on the spectrum, is there ways that we can help incorporate those special interests inside of maybe a social story or inside maybe your visual schedule along with it um, to help them get through the day or help them get through that particularly um, grueling task for them or that transition that really is difficult for them? It's also a great way just instructionally, if you can incorporate characters or 
things that I mean, I, I've certainly done that with with things like story problems, you know, changing them around. So it's the character that they're interested in that is the subject of the story problem. Or if you're counting, uh, you know, for younger kids, if you're counting something, so count my little ponies instead of, uh, you know, instead of little counters or you know, you can, there's lots of different ways or, or when you're, you know, doing words or having to write sentences or writing activities, incorporate those can be a great way to uh, really, really motivate it and make it more fun for, for the girls we're working with. Um, so just looking at some of other strategies to, uh, going into the classroom. So breaking work into smaller chunks, if we know that, um, like I said, like maybe math in particular is a really difficult time for them. You know that it's hard for them to sit if it's a 30 minute session. How can you break that up into smaller pieces? Can it be 10, uh, 10 minute uh, work chunks and they take a five minute break in between? Or can we break it down to the eight minutes and then a two minute break? And then we can continue on that way. But um, really reading your student and understanding that are there particular times of day that are causing major anxiety? Are they causing you as an educator major anxiety? How can we break this work up? How can we help support the student? How can we support the entire classroom as a whole um, by making this one task easier? And again, we can revert back to those schedules, those visual schedules, how they can have a, a particular uh, independent timer on their desk where they can break up their work. Um, and nobody would even need to know that they're taking that, that break or they're having their quiet time or they're, they're sitting at their desk and they're having a moment. So um, really looking at um, if there's, there's large bulks of work that cause that, that issue in the classroom, breaking it into smaller pieces. Um, student seating. Um, this, in particular, if you do have a student on the spectrum and they are on an IEP, an individual education plan, this is something that should be listed in maybe the accommodations or the modifications piece of their IEP. So if you do have a, a student on the spectrum, um, a, a female on the spectrum, I suggest taking a peek at those because maybe there's something going on in the classroom and you might not even have peeked at those modifications, those accommodations, and noticed that they should be having preferential seating up close to the teacher. Um, it could be listed that they need maybe a uh, something to raise their work up because they might not be able to see well. Um, so make, really making sure that you're taking a look at those. Um, and then just reading, again, reading the child. Is there a certain time of day that there's maybe there's a something that goes on in the hallway at a certain time of day and it's super distracting to them and you notice that they're spending most of their time during reading looking out the door because there's something going on out in the hallway um so we want to be aware we want to make sure that we are uh, helping our students as best we can um and making sure that they're you know they're being less affected by some of the things that are going on in the classroom Providing a quiet area, again, if uh, you need that quiet space to decompress, to calm down, um, letting that be readily available or, or available if they need to do that independently as well. Um, and then any schedule changes, uh, making sure that if there's, we know that there's a field trip coming up on Thursday and it's, our, and it's Monday, how can we prepare not only that one in particular student, if you have one or two or three females, but how we, can we prepare this entire class to make sure that this is gonna be a smooth field trip, that there's not gonna be any issues with transition, that we know our expectations. We wanna make sure that there's schedule reviews. So Thursday, I know that 11 o'clock, we're gonna leave for a field trip. How we, can we prepare not only the students, but a whole classroom to go on this field trip? And again, reminders, timers, those are great. It takes, like Luann said, it takes the argument out of the activity being older over or the transition happening. It's saying that that timer is going off and it's time to transition or it's time to move on to the next task as well. Yeah, those signals at transitions are a big thing because it helps everybody get prepared better. Um, and there's so many ways to do that. Uh, it can be a timer you know, doing something visual with a, with a light or, um, you know, a musical tone uh, it can be something auditory like that. I've certainly seen teachers of young kids very successfully use transition songs when they end one thing and are moving to another. Uh, those are, those are great ways to help all kids and help our, help our girls on the spectrum be more prepared for what's coming next. So before we move on to the next 
slide, um, I want to thank you all for participating in this webinar. To obtain a certificate of completion, you must fill out the form at the, and the certificate of completion link at the bottom of the email for this training. Please write this code down. I will have to give you the code at the end of the webinar. All right, let's talk about social emotional challenges. Um, girls on the autism spectrum deal with the same kind of social emotional challenges of boys, but because they tend to be more socially motivated, they can react to those challenges quite differently. Um, like all persons with autism, they frequently misunderstand or misinterpret uh, cues in social situations. And so for, for anyone with ASD, this can lead to social isol isolation. But because girls so much more are so much more interested in being social and are much more aware of their deficits, they really want to be social. Um, but this can lead to um, some mental health issues. Depression, anxiety uh, are very common. Um, looking at, um, you know, this can lead to things like eating disorders or, uh, you know, as kids get older, there can be suicidal ideation. So we really want to make sure that we are aware of this and that we're giving girls strategies to deal with their emotions, their emotions and their feelings as they come up. Um, bullying and victimization uh, can happen for any child on the autism spectrum. However, uh, just like with neurotypical kids, you know, you talk, we talk about mean girls. Well, they're, you know, that's a real thing. And um, uh, girls on the autism spectrum can be, you know, socially bullied or victimized in a way that is not always easy to see on the surface. Yeah, and I think, I mean, especially we look at COVID times and we've been in them for quite some time. We, we know that we've been living on Zoom and we've been living on the internet. And I think that, um, being behind a screen um, and not being able to see faces and necessarily uh, understand um, body language and things like that. When we talk about our females with autism, it becomes difficult. And, and that's where we see the bullying or the victimization coming into play where, you know, the mean girls club, like Luann said, if they're, if they're getting a text from um, uh, some females that they might think are friends or are friends in their class and they're saying things, but they're not, understanding the context that it's in. Um, that's where we can see where it can cause some of those anxieties, depression and, and the victimization and, and it can become very mean and, and depressing for those uh, females on the spectrum. And I think as teachers, we really have to watch those social interactions with, with our girls with autism and you know, with, with, um, with others because it may not be really overt some of the things that are going on whether when they're anxious with depression. Remember, they're good at camouflaging. So you may not necessarily see this on first glance. You may have to, so rather than just walking by, you may have to stop for a few minutes and listen to conversations and really watch interactions, not just give a quick glance, you know, as you go by, because um, it's very easy to miss some of these things. And we want to be sure that we're monitoring closely and that we're giving girls strategies they need to be more socially success, uh, successful. Yeah, and again, like that internalization, it could be days ago, it could be weeks ago that something was done and then they're internalizing it and then it finally comes out and it could cause a blow up or it could cause a major um, tantrum, but it's something that could have possibly happened weeks or days ago um, that they just have been particularly internal, internalizing and kind of festering over. Um, I wanna give you all that code for the webinar, it's CAL112021. Again, the code for the webinar is CAL112021. So one of the things when we're talking about social and emotional anxiety is really, it's very important to be able to talk to parents. Um, what for what they're seeing, what the girls, uh, you know, what their girls are reporting as far as interactions with others, how parents know that they're anxious, or you know, the kind of things that trigger outbursts. That way, we can be more prepared with them. And also, they may not necessarily talk about these things to us at school, but they may be saying things at home to parents. And so, having the um, 
that communication lines open with parents uh, for girls on the spectrum is, is a very important thing. And remember, parents may be seeing something very different at home than what you're seeing at school. And it's important that we merge those pictures and have a, a good rounded picture to be able to best um, help our girls socially. Um, some of the other things that we can do, we, we really, there's lots of things we can do to teach uh, kids coping skills. This can start from very basic things. I have an example of my, my birthday cake that I frequently use with kids to teach deep breathing, uh, where you touch each candle, take a deep breath and blow out each candle. It's taking, uh, teaching calming using a, what's generally, um, you know, a positive image of the birthday cake. And, uh, can, and it's one of those things like uh, we had talked about, you can put in a quiet area once you've taught a child how to use it uh, to be able to continue to do. There's lots of different coping strategies and there's wonderful um, internet programs that some are developed for schools uh, for uh, you know, yoga or meditation, or there's cards that you can use with these things. And these are great for the whole class, um, but are also just so useful for our girls. They're also very popular things to do nowadays. So, so it you know, helps, helps kids learn some skills that they can maybe be able to use socially or, or elsewhere in the community as well. Uh, we can also do lots of things like problem solving logs uh, to help help um, a child, you know, more concretely break down a situation and understand what to do step by step. Uh, so this works with some cognitive restructuring. Um, sensory items we've talked about a little bit already. You may have those in your in your quiet area. There's also lots of things that there's jewelry and things that girls can wear that may be you know, fairly typical looking. It's not going to make them stand out, but bracelets or necklaces where you can move the beads or where you can twist the bracelets, those are things that can be calming for them if they're not distracting and that don't single them out as being different from anyone else. Yeah, and I think it's important to know that as teachers in the, in the classroom, um, most of the time and throughout the school year, you're the one that's with that, that child or that student most of the time, most of the day, most of the week. Um, so if you're noticing things in the classroom that uh, might be happening or you, you seem like you're seeing a difference in behavior or things like that um, with a particular female in your classroom or a child and, and it just doesn't seem right, make sure again like that the line of communication with the parents is open. Find out if something's going on at home. Maybe grandma's sick. Maybe there's been a change. Maybe dad's on uh, away on a work trip. Um, but just making sure that you're, under, you're knowing that the communication lines are open. Um, and that there could possibly be triggers of anxiety or um, things that could be going on at school, but they're manifesting from things that are coming at, from home. <laughs> so group situations is something that most of, that our girls really struggle with. And so having strategies to help deal with group situations is, is very important for us. Um, so this, they'll need that. Some of the things we need to look at is the downtime afterwards, giving them a way to do. So trying to set your schedule or your routine where you're following an intensive um, group activity with uh, something where uh, either a break or where, where, you're, where your female student can work independently for a while. That's really going to help them get back on track. Um, allowing your student to work alone. There may be, there are certain activities that have to be done in the group. But if that's something um, you know you have a girl that really struggles with, giving the opportunity to um, to do it by themselves, or maybe for doing at least part of the part of the activity on their own, may be a very helpful thing. We want to encourage group activity, but we don't want to overload students with it. And sometimes we just need all of us just need that break away from it. Uh, the other thing is really looking at assigning groups rather than always allowing students to self-select. We want to make sure that our girls with autism are working with partners who are going to be supportive of them and, you know, uh, patient of, of some of their, their differences or their challenges. Uh, we don't always choose the best partners. The people that we're drawn to are not always necessarily the best ones for us to work with. So uh, thinking about that, and that's where it's very important to really observe closely student interactions to see um, you know, beyond the surface of what's going on and who, who really seems like a good match or someone that, that is going to be helpful to, you know, going to, to help, uh, help our girls um, uh, work at their very best.
And I think that just even uh, going back to like allowing them to work alone if they need to, um, like I said, if maybe math is a particularly difficult time and they have a group assignment for that, um, maybe you allow them to work in the group for the 10 out of the 30 minutes and then they get to go work alone. Or maybe they, they want to come back in the middle and, and share their thoughts and ideas and then go back and work alone. Just allowing them to make those choices. And it's, it's kind of like offering a child uh, a banana or an apple. It's like, you, want, you know that they're gonna, they need to eat a piece of fruit. So which one would you like? Would you like to have a banana or would you like to have an apple? So are there, regardless, they're gonna be doing the same work, but are they if, giving them the choice? Would you wanna work alone or do you wanna work in a group? they're gonna be able to get that work done. It might not be in a group at that, that day, but maybe the next day, because you've allowed them to make that choice, they choose to work in the group, maybe even just for a little bit of time. So making them feel encouraged and making them feel um, independent, again, they're making them feel worthy and, and they have that self-worth of choosing um, where they what they can do and how they can do it, um, even if they're completing the same work, just in a different manner. You know, and I've used also with that, Caitlin, I've used, um, I have used visuals like passes and things. If if we don't want to call a student out or make a point of saying, you know, I'd like you to, you know, you can work alone or making those choices and they don't want to draw attention to themselves, you can use pass cards or, you know, notes or things like that too. So that's more sort of, um, it's a little more subtle and, and, and the student doesn't feel like they're being singled out when they're doing something like that. Yeah, and I think again, it just and coming back whole group every maybe everybody gets that kind of pass maybe the entire classroom gets a pass like that. Um, where maybe that particular student gets more but it's but the entire class can get a pass that maybe one day of the week they can decide that they want don't want to work in a group or they want to go and do something else on their own in their own space. Social so, stories and power cards do you want to talk about social stories and i'll move on to the power cards. That sounds like a good plan I like it. So social stories, you can, it's amazing these days that you can Google and find social stories for almost any issue online. There's tons of free and there's tons of low cost examples. When we're using social stories with kids and some of them are and ones that are very particularly aimed at females too. And so I'm always looking for ones with, when I'm working with girls, I'm trying to use female oriented pictures um, because we all respond better to pictures of people who look like us or remind us of ourselves when we're trying to learn a skill. So trying to find um, um, female pictures or adding my own pictures that are of girls when I'm doing social stories for girls. You wanna make sure the social story that you are um, picking or writing is appropriate for the cognitive and social level of the girl that you're writing for. For example, if you're uh, doing a social story, uh, for example, about menstruation, you may not need a social story that talks about the entire female reproductive system and how it works. Just, you know, you're just doing the basics. And you wanna make sure too, that if you can't find something that's appropriate for your student, you can use things that you do find as a basis for those stories and add your own um, pictures. We wanna make sure when we do social stories, we want to focus not on what we don't want kids to do, but what we want them, the skills we want them to have and the things we want them to understand. So that should always be the main focus of the story. There's lots of great places to find pictures. You can always do Google images. There's a great program um, that's uh, called Lesson Picks. That's, it's a subscription program. Um, it's pretty low cost. I use that one a lot for visuals, but there's just so many, and you can always just cut things out of magazines or, you know, get pictures that way. Um, or take your own pictures. That's the wonderful thing about uh, cell phones. We can always uh, do our own pictures, and sometimes the girls really enjoy acting out or, you know, posing for the pictures that go in the story. Um, so, uh, you know, they're really, really powerful, and they're great things to use. Um, you can put those in your quiet area um, and, you know, but you, you want to go through it initially at least and review them and go over them with our kids. And then after we have um, do, do that, we can have them available to review um, either, you know, before activities that we know that are challenging or at times of the day uh, or, you know, to, to look at afterwards to help them regroup. Yeah. And just a bit on social stories before I moved to power cards. I used to use them um, frequently, like I said, like if there's a field trip coming up on a Thursday, you can quickly put a, a, 
uh, social story together about going to Target or going to Walmart or going to um, the pumpkin patch since it's fall. Um, and you can quickly put one of those together and you can use it in your classroom and, and review it as a whole group. Um, I used to put it on a smart board and review it as a whole group on time we're leaving, where we're going, what we're doing. And again, find those pictures online. Most of the time you can find um, pictures of real people doing real things um, in those particular locations. So putting that quickly together um, and, and put, laying out expectations, not just for maybe one in particular student, but the entire group. And it works really well for helping again with those anxieties and those transitions and things like that. So they know what's expected of them. They know what's coming. They know where they're going um, and they know what they're gonna see. One of my favorite social stories that I did with a student was uh, working with a, a, a young lady who was having an issue with cursing. And uh, we didn't write the social story about cursing. We wrote the social story about what you can say when you're mad. And so we spent a lot of time um, going through that. And uh, so we created certain phrases and we read that. And she started using all of those different phrases when she was angry. And then she started combining them in unique ways to make up <laughs> new phrases. So it was really effective and we never even mentioned cursing, so. Yeah. And then that, that kind of flows into power cards. And um, when I was in the classroom, I, I worked in a transition classroom. So these individuals were ages 18 to 22. Um, most of them higher functioning, um, quite a few ladies that were going out and doing community-based vocational um, education programs and working out in the, in the, in the, um, the community. Um, I'm prefacing this pre-COVID times. <laughs> um, so, and it's difficult to carry around when you think social stories, they're, they're kind of lengthy, they're quite, quite bulky if you think of a social story. Um, so what we use would be power cards and you can again utilize those special interests. Um, when we talk about power cards, you wanna make sure that you're, you're gearing towards their interests. So if it's somebody that they really like, um, Miley Cyrus. So you would utilize Miley Cyrus in the story. So Miley Cyrus is going to work. When Miley Cyrus goes to work, she does X, Y, and Z. And you want to make sure that they're, again, they're all positives. We're not saying anything about the negative things that might be going on in the workplace, but this is the way that we present ourselves at work. These are the things we say when we go out to work. And this is how Miley would do it. And then a power card is typically about the size of like an index card, a smaller index card. And what you would do is you create the, the social story and then they carry around the power card with them, which has the picture of their special interest and it has their rules on their power card. So um, if you look at this example, keep your hands to yourself, say I can play with play with you. Um, so all of the positive things that you do out, um, out in public or out when, when you're um, in the community. And this is really good with like discretion. So if there's something that's going on in the workplace that might be inappropriate, they can carry around the small and you can even make them as small as a business card in their pocket where if there's um, maybe something comes up and you, you have um, your teaching or you're out in the community with them, you can say pull out your your card and they can discreetly look at the rules without having this entire social story that they have to read through or go through. Um, so that's what's really great about power cards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so different things we can do to teach social skills. Um, Caitlin, do you wanna talk a little about lunch clubs and structure and playground routines? Sure. So um, lunch clubs are great. Um, we used to have like a girls club when I was teaching. Um, a lot of the times um, we noticed that um, maybe like we said there, typically if um, there's a girl that might be in a classroom and it might be mostly males, she might be by herself. Um, I worked in a school in particular that was all students that had um, some form of autism diagnosis. So the girls were split up and they were placed in different classrooms and maybe they had friends in other classrooms. So we created um, what we called like a girls club, a lunch club. Um, and they would meet every other week and there would be some form of girly activity. They would go, they would have lunch and maybe it was manicure day or um, they were doing, uh, the holidays would come around and they would create Christmas ornaments. And they were, it was just a nice way for them to kind of have semi-structured activity. So again, 
keeping it fun and light, but having some form of activity that they're able to socialize. Um, and then we can utilize those as teaching moments. So maybe they're communicating with, with somebody in that, so in that lunch club and there's something that comes up that might socially not be appropriate. Um, we can teach in those moments. So when they go out in the community and they're, they're talking to um, other individuals that maybe might not know that they do have autism, that they're able to interact appropriately, um, especially communication, again, that the verbal piece and um, the nonverbal body language, the way that they come off when they're, they're communicating and speaking with other individuals. I think too, looking at the playground, especially for younger kids, um, so many, our kids on the spectrum tend to struggle with open-ended activities or, so on the playground, they may do, you'll see girls in particular, they may do a lot of wandering they may kind of move from place to place and they kind of look like they're engaged, but if you watch closely, they may not really be very engaged. Setting up like a, you know, an activity table at, at a picnic table or, or somewhere where there's something a little more structured for them to do like a drawing table or someplace with some Play-Doh or something like that. So there's an activity that they can talk to or engage, you know, with others a little bit in it, but also have something a little more concrete to do. Um, and it will draw other kids who have, you know, similar interests can be a really helpful strategy. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about video modeling for a minute. This is a great strategy for teaching girls how to better uh, navigate social situations. Um, we're also tied to, you know, to Instagram and TikTok and all of our little video reels and everything now. And uh, you can, the, the social skill videos are, are kind of a similar strategy where um, we can watch and see how to better handle different situations. And you can find, there are programs um, once again on the internet for, you can find video modeling of just about any social, social situation from, you know, how to greet someone to, you know, how to ask for a date. Um, we want one site that's really good and has a whole lot of different things and uses a lot of girl models as well for a lot of their videos is called Everyday Speech. And we're going to show you a quick clip here of a situation that is very common for girls on the spectrum. There are some things that we shouldn't say out loud. We all have thoughts about other people. These may be good thoughts or not so good. If we have thoughts about other people that aren't so good, we should keep them in our head. If we say all of our thoughts out loud, it can hurt people's feelings. When we have thoughts about other people, we need to stop and think, should I think it or should I say it? Your birthday this weekend was awesome. Oh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it, but I got you a gift. Look, I don't even like this color. I don't want it. What happened there? Let's see what Alessandra is thinking. I hate the color. <laughs> Why did she get me that? Alessandra is upset. When she got a present she didn't like, she yelled at Serena and gave the present back. How do you think that made Serena feel? Let's see what the girls are thinking. That was so mean. Serena did something nice for Alessandra by getting her a gift. I can't believe she yelled at me like that. She really hurt my feelings. I don't want to hang out with her anymore. Serena feels hurt. The girls don't understand why Alessandra told Serena she didn't like the present. Alessandra had a thought that could hurt someone. Remember, if our thoughts are going to hurt someone, we should keep these thoughts inside. When someone gives you a gift, always say thank you. You might not really like it, but telling someone you don't like their gift will hurt their feelings. 
Let's watch Alessandra try again. Your birthday party this weekend was awesome. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't make it, but I got you a present. like this shirt. Should I think it or say it? This will hurt Serena's feelings. I'll keep the thought inside. Thanks, Serena. I really appreciate it. Hope you can come next time. You're welcome. That time, Alessandra kept her thoughts inside. If you're having thoughts that might hurt someone's feelings, it's important to stop and think. Should I think it or should I say it? This is a great example of a video for social skills because it's doing a couple things. It's looking at perspective taking, which is a challenge for our kids on the, aut on, on the autism spectrum to think about what somebody else or seeing something from somebody else's perspective. Um, it also shows examples and non-examples of what you should do. So it, it, it teaches it from both perspective. And there are, there are lots of those out there. And I really encourage uh, people to look at them. Um, other social skill programs that we that are that are very interesting uh, for girls. One is called uh, the Peers Curriculum. Uh, they developed one for school-based professionals at UCLA. In fact, they have a, a whole bunch of different Peers Curriculum. The school-based one is a 16-week program. Um, it's got lots of clinical research beside it, uh, behind it, and in, in really looking at improving social skills and social interactions for students on the spectrum. And it's customized for school-based professionals, psychologists, guidance counselors, behavior staff, speech therapists, anyone who might have the opportunity to run groups um, with, with uh, students on the spectrum. It's really broken down into specific lesson plans. There are concrete rules and steps for each lesson. There are homework assignments, plans for review, and uh, there's, there's parent handouts and things as well. So it's really looking at uh, all the things that we can do to help. Um, it, it's a very comprehensive program that can be uh, put into place in the school setting. There's lots of role uh, playing as well, which is good. Yes, there is lots of role playing and lots of practice, which is yeah. practice with skills, which is very important for, for our kids on the spectrum. Um, another really interesting uh, model out there that you might want to check out is what's called Girls Night Out. Uh, this one is a social skills and, and self-care uh, program that was de uh, developed by the University of Kansas uh, Medical Center. Um, it's looking at girls with autism and also with other disabilities, and they're doing a lot of uh, best practices as part of this is where they have trained um, peer mentors who do socials, who participate in social skill lessons. It's, it's an ongoing program. There's multiple sessions, so they do... Um, do actual social skill lessons uh, with the girls who are on the spectrum. Uh, they have an ongoing program and start to form an ongoing bond. And all of the lessons they do are followed up by community-based social activities where they get a chance to practice the strategies that they've learned and also participate in um, community-based activities with peers that a lot of our girls on the spectrum may not necessarily get uh, the opportunity to do. So that's when I really encourage you to, you know, take a look and, and check out uh, for things that you could do, you know, either on a community wide basis or that could be incorporated on a smaller scale in school settings. Yeah, because I think that that's the one thing like we can teach it in the classroom and we can, you know, we can control some of those settings um, and we can again, like if there's something that comes up, we can teach in those moments. But when you get them in the community and they get them involved in um, with individuals that might not necessarily know that our females are on the spectrum, you want to see how they communicate. You want to be able to um, see if they can can put that in what they've learned in a structured setting in an unstructured setting. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes along with our, our last one is, is internet safety. And again, I, I have a manual here. Um, it's very comprehensive. It's free. You can download it online. It's in our resources. Um, our resources uh, link um, on the following slide. And it's very comprehensive. It goes in depth into cyberbullying and catfishing and certain things that might come up, especially with our female population. Um, we all know that um, individuals on the spectrum are more likely to be victimized or um, be, have um, interactions online that could be predatorial. 
So we, the teaching internet safety and teaching um, valuable skills to make sure our females are being safe online and not communicating with individuals online that could possibly harm or hurt them is a big deal, um, especially in this day and age. So really looking at internet safety and understanding the do's and the don'ts of the internet um, is a big one, especially for our females. Absolutely. And that is it. Um, here's our resources. They will be linked as well um, in this webinar. Um, we appreciate you joining in and hope you enjoyed um, our series. Um, we look forward to hearing some feedback and look for the next um, uh, training that will be coming up in December. And just in conclusion, I think too, it's, it's easy to remember girls with autism, they're feisty and they're fun and they're fabulous. And our schools can be a nurturing and happy place for our girls to go, um, our girls on the spectrum to go. If as educators, we really try to recognize their challenges and address them um, proactively and compassionately um, and give them all those strategies that they need to survive and to thrive in school. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Have a great day, guys.